Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nick Davis, and I'm the Communications Director of LEN European Aquatics. It's a great pleasure to be with you today with some distinguished guests as moderator for a panel discussion entitled The Road to Better Governance, a case study from LEN European Aquatics. Our simple aim is to share some practical insights and learnings from the ongoing efforts we're making to put integrity at the heart of everything that we do. We sincerely hope you will find the presentations both useful and interesting. My guests today include the president of LEN, Antonio Silva, LEN treasurer and Dida Buma, and bureau members Pia Johansson and Graham Marshbank. May I now introduce the president of European Aquatics, Antonio Silva. Thank you, Antonio, you have the floor. Hello, I'm Antonio Silva, and I am the president of the European Aquatics Federation LAN. I'm very happy to be with you today with three of my LAN bureau colleagues to support the 2023 Sports Integrity Unit organized by SIGA. The 2023 Sports Integrity Unit is the pinnacle for all those in sports industry with an interest in sports integrity. Events are being hosted in several cities around the world, as well as online, as we commend SIGA for promoting this decentralized approach to raise global awareness of this, its mission and vision. European Aquatics decided to partner with SIGA for this event because we are proud to be part of the world's leading global movement in the field of sports integrity, but also to show how a sport governing body can develop concrete projects in the field of sports integrity. This webcast will answer some quick questions, which I hope you will find interesting and useful. Firstly, when and why did integrity and good governance become a key priority for European aquatics? What were the key priorities for European aquatics and what was the process to ensure that objectives could be achieved within agreed timeframes? What were the challenges and lessons learned from trying to enforce constitutional reform and from setting up structures for integrity and inclusion and gender equality? I would like to start by setting the scene. European Aquatics had a complete change of management over the past year and a half. When I was elected as president of LEN in February 2022, Together with an entirely new bureau, it was clear that there was overwhelming support and a clear vision to end a governance system which was, which was considered top-down and opaque in terms of decision-making and to set up a new culture which could develop the sports of aquatic in a collaborative, inclusive and united way. We made a throughout review of the land resources, structure and operational methods so that we can make changes that will improve the organization so it can better serve the federations, athletes, and other stakeholders. But it was also vital that we worked on changing the culture of land to make it more open, democratic, and forward-looking. We are committed to putting integrity at the heart of everything we do, but we have also ramped our communication so that national federations are kept aware of what we are doing. We are only at the beginning of a journey to transform European aquatics. Together, we have a lot of work to do. So the first step involves honesty about what is not working well or can be improved. Through democracy means respecting opinions and listening to different voice. This principle of transparency underpins of all our work. We have made sure that our member federations receive regular communications about bureau decisions and activities. But underpinning everything we do is good governance. Let's now go into more detail about the journey that LEN has taken on the road to better governance. And I'm delighted that I'm joined today by three of my LEN bureau colleagues, the LEN treasurer and Dina Bauma, and two of our bureau colleagues, Pia Anson and Gray Marchbank. They will share with you the key details of three teams. And Dida will share the step taken to improve land governance, the land action plan, and the relationship with SIGA. Pia will present all the work done to introduce a new land integrity code and independent integrity unit. Graham will describe the work done to date and planned for land diversity and inclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. And let me know to hand over 
to our moderator for the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. That's a very interesting introduction. And that leads us nicely to the, the first theme here, which will be introduced by um, Andida Buma. Andida, you have the floor. And could you please, when you introduce yourself, explain a little bit your background in the sport. It isn't just as a Bureau member. Um, and also why, if you like, you were selected to lead this important uh, topic uh, within LEN, your background, if you like, your qualifications um, would be very interesting for us to hear. And Didi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Andida Bauma. I joined uh, the LEN Bureau uh, at the same time as my uh, fellows uh, on this call and Antonio uh, to uh, uh, in February 2022. And um, one of the, let's say, promises we made in our manifesto, what we, what, we, what we had before we were elected, is to really strive for the highest level of integrity and standards. So implement new policies, make, making uh, decision-making structures, and uh, make sure that we govern the sport transparently and ethically. So this is a, a big word, let's say, big wording. Um, and the key concept, as, as I think Antonio also introduced, was are the integrity, transparency and accountability, cooperation and communication, I will talk all about that later, and, and diversity and inclusion. So these topics will come back in this, uh, in this uh, presentation uh, later on, uh, also introduced by my colleagues. So we would uh, like to take you uh, through the journey we've, we've, we've been going through and we're still going through actually. Um, so how are we going to implement best practice government's principles? Actually, there were few actions that we took immediately, which were already lined up when we got elected. One was to prepare for constitutional change as, as our constitution was pretty let's say outdated, it for example, did not have time limits for uh, board bureau members or, or committee members. So that was introduced um, uh, in the first uh, Congress after, uh, after our election in uh, May 22. And we also immediately implemented what we call a whistleblowing hotline with the help of, of an agency um, where uh, anybody basically could um, go and mention any uh, items that they felt were against good governance, against integrity, any other problems they had. So that was, uh, let's say, a really first step, uh, but that's clearly only the start. So um, we had to also come up with a framework and, and met how to measure our progress in what we were doing. So we have um, chosen in at that moment to adopt the SEGA universal standards for good governance in sport. Now that was, um, let's say very easily said, uh, but then the process actually also of um, checking that you are doing what you are saying starts. So that would be the next, was our next step. Thank you, Andida. Um, what is very interesting to me actually is when you have a situation like this, um, such a major topic, you know, good governance or better governance is is how do you prioritize? That must be the, one of the most challenging parts of it. Where do you start? It's, it's such a big job. Yeah, I think um, from the start, it was quite clear that integrity is, was a major part of what we needed to work on as there was really nothing in place. And, and later on, Pia will, will elaborate on that. Um, but also, like uh, there were when we started, I think uh, we we very soon found out that there was nothing in terms of how do you set up meetings, how long you know is when do you send an agenda, when do you uh, so there was no policies or procedures basically in place for that. So um, that became a priority because it uh, you know we we needed to learn how to cooperate and and do that in a in a well-structured manner. So that that was uh, what we now call our rules of procedure, which we started to develop uh, with the help of a couple of bureau members that stepped in to do that. 
and which is now a uh, well, great help in uh, you know being efficient, but also actually transparent for everybody that's on the bureau and and communicate to the outside world. All right. Well, um, if we then look at uh, what we did with uh, implementing or, or the the SIGA standards. Uh, the, there was a, a first uh, audit that took place right after the uh, our election, and that was basically to kind of assess the situation at that point. So not much has changed as yet. Uh, really, we we didn't even have the new constitution. So when they when Siga did that that audit, um, there were twenty non-conformities, as they call it. So. It, before we could even get any standard, we would have to resolve those. Um, and uh, we we work quite hard on that. But if you look at those, um, I think um, I, about six were in the area of democracy, but the majority, the basically the, the rest, so like, like 14, were in the area of transparency and accountability. And I think that was also because uh, we were not very well aware yet of what we needed to do. So um, we also had to actually do better homework in terms of understanding what we would need to, to show, write down, how we would need to document things, how we would need to show things. And, and a lot of that, as, as, as Graham also said, was about being transparent and, and communicating. Uh, and I think that's more also your area, Nick, communicating to our stakeholders what we are actually doing. So that, that I think, was a big um, eye-opener in how to work on, on actually achieving uh, these standards. And um, we did another kind of update uh, audit uh, in, uh, in the second quarter of this year. And that, that really resulted in uh, a lot of the uh, non-conformities being, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, resolved. Uh, particularly um, uh, also in the area of, of integrity and, and diversity and inclusion, which we will hear more about, and uh, also in the area of, let's say, transparency and communication, because it appeared that a lot was maybe there, but it wasn't like accessible to the outside world. So there, I think we, we made a big effort now to make sure that, that all of these documents and, and policies are actually uh, available to people. Yeah, and if I, I mean, I think that's a really excellent point, Andida. You know, one thing I, I feel is, is helpful for us, others to realize, often you do have the information. It's, it's what we were saying earlier about the culture, isn't it, of openness and, and not being afraid to share things and being transparent. Um, you know, the... You know the guidelines that were given to us, if you like, by by Sega to, to get to that bronze level. You know, yes, there's certain things which need to be introduced, but probably the majority of things already do exist. And it's a question, isn't it, of, of making those available and being open and not being, if you like, afraid to share information. Um, I think you know, and and it it also brings us to the next point quite nicely of of the whole consultation process. Um, you know how important it is when you're going through this um, these changes to not to do it in isolation and either I think one of the things we would say here is that all of this has been done or the steps that have been taken so far have been done with if you like the knowledge of the federations of the members of LEN European Aquatics um, it hasn't been done quietly and sort of you know exposed at the end this is something which has been you know, a, a collaboration, hasn't it, Andida? Yes, uh, it, it certainly has, and uh, I think um, that's also if you if you look at um, lessons learned, right? Um, maybe it first um, we, I think, had our own ideas and and we used our common sense, uh, and we worked very hard. But it would also have uh, maybe helped a bit if we read the policies a bit more in detail and would actually have involved more people within the organization and, and more of our stakeholders uh, earlier on, then we would probably have, uh, well, been able to go a bit faster. Right. Well, look, thank you very much, Andida, um, for that presentation. Very interesting. Um, now I'd like to introduce um, another of the guests here with us, uh, Pierre Johansson. 
and Pierre's going to talk about the, the the detailed focus on integrity and the the ethics code. Um, Pierre, uh, like, like uh, Andida, if you wouldn't mind just introducing, you know, very briefly your background in the sport. I know you're also at the Danish Federation and uh, the work you're doing in this area. And then, please, you can you can carry on with your presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, to be part of this. Uh, I am president of the Danish Swimming Federation, uh, and um, I have been that since uh, uh, April 21. And uh, I was elected a bureau member uh, together with uh, you guys. And when Antonio was elected president in February 22, um, in the Danish uh, in in the in the Danish Federation, uh, we have been working with also a new culture, a new strategy, a new way of doing things. Uh, and I'm, of course, taking this into the work I'm doing at LAN. Uh, and in my civil career, I have also experienced uh, from this field. Uh, yeah. What I'm going to talk about is uh, the LAN Integrity Code. I was uh, asked uh, from the beginning if I wanted to be uh, the first point of contact towards the independent hotline that we have asked the company to, to run for us. And I, I accepted, of course. Uh, and, and part of that was also to be uh, the leading uh, on this um, making a land integrity code. And of course, there was something before, but we again needed to restart and, and needed to, to make a culture change. Um, so that's why we kind of wanted to start from the very beginning. And then again, maybe we did start a little bit backwards because some people would make the code and then when everything is in place, like it is almost now, uh, then we would ask and start the independent hotline. We started the independent hotline right away because we wanted to be there for the athletes that we wanted to show that this was a very important task. And I think that has been a very good choice. Uh, we have learned a lot. It has been a little learning by doing. From the very beginning, we had regular meetings uh, with uh, the company running the, the hotline. And we have had a lot of very good discussions on how this company uh, handles uh, the other issues, the other uh, customers that they have. Uh, we have also, along the way, had regular meetings with uh, World Aquatics uh, and their uh, ethics officer in this field. And that has given a lot of, of very good discussions. And uh, also, it has been very easy to be aligned all the way. Um, if I should say a little about the, the process, we started um, uh, designing a blueprint, uh, and this was presented uh, in the Congress in uh, Kaskai in May uh, 22. Uh, and, and there was a lot of good discussions uh, along with that. After the Congress, people coming up and talking about, uh, asking questions um, about what, they thought, what, what their thoughts had been. Uh, we, of course, uh, had uh, discussions in the Land Bureau as well. And uh, in Rome during the European Championships last year, we had uh, meetings with the technical committees and the athlete committee, uh, and they were all there. And we had with each committee and explaining to them, what is this about? Um, what is integrity? What is an integrity code? Why are we to going, going to have this? And why is it so important? And um, of course, this is like Graham also, like you also said, this is a lot about transparency. But but when it's so important to talk to everybody, it's of course involvement and you have to feel that you uh, are being heard, but it's also for teaching purposes. One of the big things about having an integrity code is that everyone knows how they are expected to behave um, and how we are good and to each other. Um, so, so that has been, yeah, that has been a very good process. Then um, we have been working again with the code, uh, 
and uh, in meetings here this spring, online meetings with all bureau members and the uh, representatives and the committees, we have again been going through what's inside. Uh, and finally, uh, the bureau has approved the code as it is now, and it will be um, ratified at the Congress here in September. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Pierre, Pierre what's the, very interesting to me here? Um, you know, this process of engaging people, bringing them with you, I think is really interesting. You know, the you mentioned the athletes, which I think is is fundamental, um, but also the technical committees, other members of of the bureau. I mean, was this something that you, that you always felt from the beginning was necessary, or did you kind of evolve into that? Because then there's been literally two or three almost different sessions of explaining where you were going with the integrity code, why it was important. Was this always in, in your mind from the very beginning to do it this way? Yeah, I think that was from the very beginning very important because transparency was a very important thing uh, for Antonio. So integrity and transparency and democracy, and that means that we have to discuss and we have to uh, also understand what what do we mean? I mean, what is it to be transparent? Is it enough that I say, hey, we do this, stop? Or is it yeah. also necessary to say, we want to do this because this is the best for, and this is the priority, this is how we prioritize. And then I would like a little to go back to Graham's predictability. That That is really a key word for a lot of people. Uh, we have to know what is going on. We have to be able to see this fits together. Uh, when we go do this, it means this, it means this, and it fits all the way uh, from one end to the other. Uh, so yes, from the very beginning, I was thinking involvement and involvement, and then again, involvement, and, and for teaching purposes as well. No, I totally understood. Yeah. So I think that 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 what has been very, very successful in this part is, of course, uh, that we have had a lot of open and very varied discussions uh, for, for better. Uh, and that has made better solutions. Uh, we have also been in regular contacts with with uh, World Aquatics uh, and that has. Uh, well, actually, I think that we have had good insurance on the aqua code as well as they of course have had given us a lot uh, for our code uh, so but but that has been very good and then uh, what i did not mention is that we we made a quite a small working group uh, uh, to to draft this code um, and i think that has also been essential that we have not been too many people around the table to come up with a draft, but we have been out and getting inputs uh, for for a lot. So I think that has uh, also been part of why we could actually come through, because it has been a, a quite a, a great work. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pierre. I mean, Graham and, and Dieter, I think this is another really important point of of the process and us wanting, if you like, to share, you know, best practice or what we feel were things that really worked. It's this issue of having a dedicated task force, isn't it? A small group of, frankly, they have to be very committed people who really believe in that and, and literally to tick off the milestones of the work that needs to be done because it's a lot of work. I mean, what would you agree with that? Andida maybe first. Well, yeah, I think uh, it's important that in the end uh, you have uh, people that, that do the work <laughs> um, and uh, not just talk about it, right? So it has to be, and, and I think uh, the approach we took with, let's say, a professional party ultimately helping us uh, with some dedicated time uh, and some people, a limited number of people from, from land that were actually also really dedicated to getting this done. But on the other hand, also yeah, involving a wider group or at least making it known that we were working on this. Uh, so everybody now, once we get to approving it in, formally in, in the Congress, is aware of that we have uh, this process, that there is this code. So uh, that's that's really, I think, also an important uh, part. So in that sense, uh, many more people have contributed. 
And, and not really much to add, Nick, to that, other than there's a famous saying about never underestimate the power of a small committed group of people to make change, because it's the only thing that ever does make change. So, yeah, a small group working hard is the, is the key to this, because that's the, that's the way that you lead and engage broader communities by having that, those people who are owning it day to day. Yeah, I know. I think that's absolutely right. And and the whole consultative process is very important, isn't it? As having this this feeling of going once, going twice, going three times, letting everyone feel they're part of it. Right? You know, it's part of everyone. The integrity, we want integrity to be at the heart of everything. Involve everyone in all the process. I think that's really important. But I think I would just pick up on that is just on what Andina said there. Though I think it's true and worth emphasising. It's it's consultation is one thing and making sure people engage is really very very important. It's somebody or a group of people have to do what has to get done yes. as well. So consultation yes. isn't about uh, everyone standing around talking to each other. Action has to be taken for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Pia, can I ask you now to talk in the detail about the integrity code itself? I mean, this is a a major milestone, isn't it? Oh, yes, uh, definitely it is. Um, well, uh, the code is set up. Uh, we From the very beginning, we wanted to mirror the Aqua code. It's very important for, for us that we collaborate with Aqua. So the sport is all aligned, uh, all aligned and fits together worldwide. Um, so if we should say a little about the uh, it starts with definitions. What does the word mean? We chose uh, to be aligned with Aqua in this sense, so we could pretty much actually copy paste just with small uh, yeah, uh, adjustments. Then uh, about the, the purpose and the scope. Well, actually, and, and that's also why involvement and, and discussion has been important, because actually the purpose, the overall purpose is not to have any reporting to an integrity hotline or anything else. But it will only happen if everybody knows how to behave and how to act and, of course, wants to do so. But but I think that part will prevent some wrongdoings within LEN. Uh, and then the purpose is, of course, also to establish some effective mechanism for enforcement of the code and, and sanctions if there's any violation. So that's also part of the purpose. But in general, uh, it's about the duties of good conduct, how to, how to be a good uh, LEN uh, member, uh, whatever is your role. If you're standing there as a, 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 a judge, official, uh, part of the bureau, or, or in any other way, uh, there's something about confidentiality and loyalty. There's something about gift policy. I could say that this has, uh, for some of the, in some of the discussion, this part has been felt, ha has really been uh, discussed. Uh, and and on this case, actually, we are a, a bit different from what uh, Aqua uh, or World Aquatics decided, uh, but still aligned, and that is fine. There's uh, something about rules for bidding for events uh, when more countries want to do a European Championship in some discipline. And of course, rules for elections, etc. Uh, then there we have the other thing: uh, manipulation for aquatics competitions. It's match fixing. It's a uh, it's the betting part that is described that we do not want to do that. And if anyone does, uh, there will be an investigation. And and then I want also to point off the safeguarding rules. And actually, this is a. Uh, this is also one of the fields that has been discussed uh, very much, and uh, Graham will be talking uh, uh, something uh, so, some about this, but it's about uh, psychological, physiological abuse and harassment and sexual harassment, and we don't want any of these. So this is also, I mean, this is the opposite. You, we want some good conduct, and when we're talking safeguarding, safeguarding we're talking about forbidden conduct so that's what you're not supposed to do uh, and that has also been one of the fields where there has been a lot of uh, discussions within the uh, committees uh, during this process um then there's uh i mean this is this is also this is almost half of it and the other half of the code is more or less dedicated uh, to how the structure how we structure the the, the code 
um, or enforcement of the integrity code, and that's how to structure the integrity unit. And um, here we really wanted to keep it simple. Um, so we have a council. Uh, it will be three people elected. One of them is the chair. And this council will be the coordinating part towards the ethics officer, who is the independent hotline, the officer of the independent, running the independent hotline. Um, they will coordinate whenever uh, there is an uh, there's a, a violation or a, an issue that has to be investigated. There will be this will be done by an investigation unit, and we had quite a few discussions if we could set up a unit by choosing three or five people. But we realized within this last year, uh, where the hotline has been up running, that the that the that it's very different fields. Uh, and for this reason, very different experience you must have if you should do an investigation in a case that is to be investigated. Um, sometimes it can be within one discipline. Sometimes it can be match fixing. Fact, you know, it's it. So so we cannot put up a small group and and say, well, they contain, they have all the knowledge that could be necessary. So we will set up the investigation unit case by case, and this will be done by the integrity council. And then uh, when they have investigated and finalized the report, uh, it will go to the adjudicatory body, which will, which will be chosen. Uh, it will be five members elected at the Congress as well, and, and they will be uh, responsible for, for deciding on, on a yeah, sanction on some. Yeah, so that's uh, that's pretty much what is this, that uh, what is in the code at the moment. Yeah, yeah I mean, Pia, the, a couple couple of interesting points. I'd be interested to hear, you know, Graham and uh, Andida's point. I mean, you know, the interesting part is, you know, protecting the physical and mental well being of athletes. I think what's interesting to me here is that everything should be about athletes anyway in in, in a sport federation, but this is for me really crucial and then the other thing which um you know maybe to address that first in, in terms of how important this is uh for for the athlete welfare and then the second part of it which i think is really interesting is the practicalities of making sure that len being the european body is aligned with aqua aqua as you said world aquatics federation so the world governing body but also that you as national federation representatives can see that connection as well, which then leads to the athletes, ironically, at the end. Um, so maybe Andida, Graham, you know, what are your thoughts about those those two parts, the athlete welfare part in the first place? Maybe, maybe I'll speak first. I, mean, I think we'll talk a little moment about so my background, but I'm also chair of, of Scottish Swimming, so I represent the 20,000 members we've got in Scotland. Um, athlete welfare is at the centre of what we do. I think there's there's been too many sad and, and well covered um, uh, uh, issues that have been faced by sports federations around the world in the last few years. Around um, uh, when things are, things go wrong in, in, in terms of welfare of, of our athletes. Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's really hugely important. Um, the first role of with any organisation is to is to consider the, the the welfare and the duty of care it has towards its members. In their situation, predominantly the athletes. So, so for me, it's very much front and center of, of consideration every single day. Um, and I think you know clearly it has to be a priority for organisations and and anybody who, who feels differently to that just has to look at you know the the the, the horrific cases in in the USA when uh, clearly US gymnastics appears to have taken a, a, a priority on reputation and commercial ahead of of athlete welfare and how and how much harm can be done to individuals and the organisation. When that prioritisation's um, gotten wrong, so so for me, it's it's absolutely essential to what we do as an organisation at all levels. And Dida, yeah. just a, a a question for you, a comment regarding the you know this, which I think is very important, this sort of red thread that goes from world governing body, European governing body, national governing body, in terms of integrity, and and that there was kind of very much at the heart of the process here, wasn't it? Yeah, I think we had quite a bit of, uh, let's say, discussions about um, who should be, um, let's say, reviewing a certain 
complaint or issue, right? And uh, for LEN, for, for European Aquatics, that is really uh, to everything that's related to, let's say, European Aquatics events or, or people that are, uh, that things that happen within our organizational uh, reach, if you want. Uh, and that otherwise it could be within the world organization or it could be in the national organization. And then we can actually refer to any of these, these bodies. Uh, but in case, for example, a national organization is not well organized in this respect, then LEN could at some point or, or World Aquatics at some point could see if they needed to do something further. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, we kind of decided uh, World Aquatics has made their code, so they are actually worldwide. So as Andita said, if if uh, they think there's a wrongdoing, a very much a wrongdoing within an organization, a national federation that are not treated well, or actually also a continental organization, they could kind of go in and say, hey, we want to investigate this part and, and figure out what is up and down and what should be done. Uh, we have decided in LEN not you know, to keep it simple. So we will concentrate on investigating on matters that is within LEN, what is happening at LEN competitions or related to LEN competitions. But we actually do not want to go in the, to the National Federation. We want to say this is for the National Federation, please find a solution, but we are not going to investigate. Well, aquatics might want to investigate if they find it's important enough. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think that's great. Um, okay, look, thanks very much, Pierre. That was very interesting um, exposition there. Um, Graham, it's um, now the time to talk about diversity and inclusion. So if you wouldn't mind just giving a very brief introduction of yourself um, and you know this important theme that Len is now embarked upon. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Nick, definitely. I think probably worth talking about the elephant in the room straight away. I'm a middle-aged white uh, man um, representing diversity and inclusion. Always feels slightly um, slightly unusual. Um, but my own background is probably saying I've had 35 years in sports governance and actually started my career with Ladies European Tour, the professional golf tour. So I've been long engaged with, uh, with women's sport, um, then right through to um, sitting on the board of directors for... Sports Scotland, the Scottish National Government Agency for, for Sport, which obviously had a strong aspect of inclusion and diversity within its own remit. Um, and then on to the world of aquatics and, say, as I said earlier, the Chair of Scottish Swimming, also the Board of British Swimming, and, and, and to my great fortune, recently been appointed to the Bureau of Lane as well. So so my, while, while I may not represent a diverse uh, uh, background or, or myself be from a, a, a minority group or underrepresented group, I like to feel that I have stood up for them throughout my 35 years of of sports governance and um, so but with that the I think it's for me as well it's probably a nice way to segue slightly from from what is a hugely important area we talked about integrity and the the importance of a welfare um uh, an, an environment that, that sports you know, sort of welfare etc it's to think about that in a broader sense and that's actually about our, our spaces being inclusionary spaces that people feel safe and feel they can go to feel they, feel they, feel they feel welcome because for me that's a that's a welfare environment where where people come and they feel safe and they feel welcome. And clearly a, a huge aspect of that is, is around diversity, diversity and inclusion. And I think from aquatic sport, there's an enormous opportunity because our sport is historically very inclusive, especially for gender and para sport as well. But beyond that as well, away from the, the, the sort of the natural space of land, which would be the historically been a high competitive space. Now we're talking more and more about aquatic sports in a broader sense. We're talking about learning to swim. We're talking about swimming pools. We're talking about then your know, young people learning to swim. We're talking about older people who whose other physical activities might be more limited and now they can continue staying healthy in, in water, whether it's families together, whether it's lower socioeconomic groups as well, taking the opportunity to develop life skills that also allows them to, to enjoy some level of activity. We clearly have a, a platform and therefore a strong responsibility to to consider diversity, diversity and inclusion, uh, and then and then drive it forward where, where we have the opportunity to do so. Um, but with that, I think um, we're on a journey, and clearly we've heard of huge work that's been done and great success that's that's have been arrived already 
through Indira and Pia as well around the, the broader governance and the integrity piece is that our diversity and inclusion agenda is, is very much at the start of its journey. Um, but clearly it's a never ending journey. As a, I think as a society, we know, a broad society, we know that the inclusion and diversity has to be something that's continually evolving, continually considered. So, so for me, in many ways, it's now it's about setting out those, those core principles. We talked earlier about a, a committed group of individuals and um, I, I won't speak for myself, but certainly those I've, I've been working with in this area led by, by Sarah Keane within, within LEN are committed to looking at uh, diversity and inclusion and, and what LEN can do and uh, LEN and European Aquatics can do to help to help that agenda more broadly. Uh, but first and foremost then is listening to our community to know where they're having great success, where they're having challenges, and understanding then the role that LEN can play in both celebrating those successes, and there's much to celebrate, and I'll talk more about that in a second, but also where we can play a role in either sharing best practice or actually bringing our assets and our, our ability or our spaces where we can bring those to bear to help drive forward the, the agenda around around DNI. So um, initially for us, the focus is on gender. I think that's where many organisations, where they take the first step um, with regards to to, to DNI, is, is going to be in that space, and, and and we are doing some work with that already. And while from a, a, a participation point of view, and even a, a competitive point of view, um, uh, we have a strong balance between male and female participation. Um, I think it's worthy of it's worth worthy of us, or it would be unworthy of us not to point out that across our whole community, LEN included, but most of our national federations as well. The governance and representation of women in those in the spaces of 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 of, of officer spaces are aren't as strong as it could be. Um, and clearly, we want to try to work with our federations and ourselves to think about how we can we can bring some change to that space. And then, really, a, a specific area of concern for us, a consideration for us, is about under under representation of women in in performance coaching. So, high representation, age group, and developmental coaching phases. But when you get to, to performance coaching female representation needs to be considered. So we're taking the first steps now to understand best practice in the federations that are trying to address this. We've already had meetings with colleagues from Sweden and from the UK as well to understand what they're doing. But we're going to go wider and broader to think of, to, to speak to more federations, understand what can be done in that space and then the role that LEN can play in helping to uh, in helping bring some change in, into that space particularly. But then, as we say, there's a journey to be done. There's more to go after that as well. Um, clearly, disability inclusion, para swimming in particular, is a, is a very strong sport in, 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 in the Paralympics. But for, for the broader disability inclusion as well, you know what we're doing in terms of representation across all the areas that the aquatic sport and governance and, and coaching, what we can do for disability. But in some ways, the harder the harder nut to crack, to sort of use a, a, British, a British saying, is going to be about racial and socioeconomic diversity. So as we're looking now to the challenge around pool closures and also access to aquatic spaces, the role that LEN again can be that hub, that central community that can bring together conversation and use our influence and our the influence of our, of our family, our broad aquatic family can have in thinking about government investment, local authority, local community investment, in around pool and pool access and what that can do for racial and socioeconomic diversity has been really important as well. And then I think the last thing I'd want to say just now before we open in case you've got any questions, Nick, is to talk about this to celebrate the successes we do have. I touched upon it earlier on about gender balance within a participation community. It's pretty strong and, and, and clearly actually over indexes in many places. Um, certainly from the own fact figures I know in Scotland, over 60% of, of, of uh, not just members of Scottish swimming, but those who take part in aquatic activity in Scotland are actually female. So that's a that's a strong over index. When, when sport and participation generally is heavily biased towards males. So that's that's a good thing and something to celebrate and wonder if that's a stronger a muscle that we can we can really use to help society more broadly. And likewise, I touched upon earlier about that age participation. Those 55 years and over, again, strong over index in terms of participation and those who play who see aquatic sport as playing a key aspect of their own uh, their own journey in health and keeping themselves keeping themselves active. So Lots to go after, uh, but certainly we've got a platform and, and strong belief we've got committed individuals um, and also some really great assets that can help can help drive uh, drive forward change in this space. Yeah, thanks very much, Graham. Very interesting. I mean, you know, the first comment I would have, which is, you know, as let's say a high performance sport federation, what's very interesting, isn't it, is what do we do about the bottom of the pyramid, getting more people involved, the health aspects. It's fascinating to see what can be done. Um, and maybe it's a question for, you know, indeed a peer as well. What, 
you know, with there's a Learn to Swim Commission working very hard. There's going to be a Learn to Swim, the first one, um, a convention in, in, in a few months' time um, in Latvia, bringing together experts, government experts. You know, this is about as much health and fitness, life skills. It's, it's a different place to elite sport and winning medals and going to Olympic Games. You know, how does an organization like LEN manage both areas just a question and data for you and Pierre, or how you see how do you manage both because it, it you know you need to do both we're responsible for both yeah i think um there is a clear um uh, let's say need for uh, well the elite sport i think is the, the role of land has always been quite clear we organize the european championships right we 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 have a, a clear role there in the let's say learn to swim space um, the role has not been that clear. There have been some um, uh, areas in the past to, to develop learn to swim programs, but that has been mostly left to national federations and some have done an excellent job, but others are clearly lagging behind. Uh, and uh, I think there's a role for LEN to particularly also help those federations or those countries where learn to swim is maybe not high on the agenda to help and raise it, raise awareness and, and get it there. Um, so I think that's a role that that has been taken up uh, since we were elected uh, quite actively. So hopefully, and and coming back to diversity and inclusion, that is also going to help create uh, well aquatic awareness among uh, many different uh, social uh, areas. Yeah, Pia, what is your opinion on that, Pia? Are you on mute? Yeah, uh, there's no doubt that that learn to swim programs is uh, is very essential for all national federations. So this is uh, a, a subject where we can come together, and where we are very much aligned of the importance. And yes, of course, it's very different how uh, it's uh, how learn to swim is prioritized on a national level. In some countries, it's a very high. Uh, awareness uh, from governments and, and in other countries, it's almost not there. So so making awareness and, and learn to swim and learn to love swimming and love aquatic sports is definitely also a task uh, for them. And it's uh, a lot about, of course, communication, but it's also about uh, providing uh, people to teach how to swim and make good teachers and good coaches for the future of the sports in, in all the disciplines. So I actually think that this is a natural place to, to be and, and, yeah. a, and, a, and a very important agenda. I think, I think Nick as well would add a little bit to this around. I think, I think it's, it's, I think it's useful and it, to think about Len in two ways. There's Len the organization who runs national championships, but then, there's also Len, the community, the family, that isn't about the staff or the bureau or the officers. It's about all of the national federations as they come together at congresses or come together at the European Championships. So Lens, as I say, is not just a thing, it's a community. And I think when we talk about the power of, of Len or European Aquatics to move in things like diversity and inclusion, learn to swim, or protection of aquatic spaces for participation as as, as, as we all face the challenges at local and government level of investment, it's that community coming together that's where the power is going to come from in this space. So so in this situation, it's about, yeah, it's about championing those and giving the opportunities for that community to come forward and drive forward together, not at the direction of delaying the organisation. No, that's great. Um, Graham, thank you very much for that. Very interesting. I think we've come pretty much to the end of our presentation, our webcast today. Um, what I'd like to do now is maybe just bring it all, bring all the strands together, if you like, and just give you what I think were the sort of five takeaways um, from the, this presentation of what Len is doing in terms of improving governance um, and in, in the field of integrity. I think for me, the five points uh, were, first of all, have a clear plan that works for your organization. Make sure it, it applies to your organization um, and be very practical about that. Get your priorities. The second thing would make sure you get your priorities in order, have an action plan with milestones that you can achieve. Um, thirdly, get a committed steering group. It can be quite small, 
and just people that you know will get the work done because that's probably the most important part of this. Fourthly, do the consultation widely with the stakeholders, bring them along with you on this journey. Um, and then I think the final thing which Pia put up on, on her slide, keep it simple. You know, the best plan in the world is useless if, if it doesn't apply in the real world. So I think those would be my five points. Um, and what I'd like to do with the, the guests we have with us today is just ask for them, what are the priorities now moving forwards? So in your opinion, Andida, from your point of view, what do you think is the next step? You know, we're not at the end of the journey by any means. And then ask the same to you, Pierre and, and Graham, in, in your fields or your areas, what are you looking at as, as the next big step? So Andida, maybe you start. Yeah, I think for us it, right now, it's it's really like finish what we started. So we, we are about to implement this code. We are about to get uh, the bronze standard, hopefully. So let's get that done, right? <laughs> But and then I think next is really uh, like Graeme said, uh, uh, talking about the family, looking out to our member federations and how we can share with them and and how we can also leverage what federations are already doing in this governance space to to help each other and and get better uh, with within Europe, right? Not just like the LAN organization, but the whole family. Thank you, Andida. Pia. Yeah, well, I I look forward to the Congress and hopefully the approval of the Integrity Code. And, and then the next step will be actually to elect the people who will be in the Integrity Unit and in the adjudicatory body and, and all the procedures to get them to work. I know it has been described in the code, but now it has to be in real. So I, I very much look forward to that. Excellent. Thank you, Pia. Graham, and then for me, Paul, because it's the it's the it's the one that's least along its journey in terms of DNI. I think it's about creating some tangible goals. I think we need to have some wins to demonstrate what we're trying to achieve, um, so people believe and go back to that point before about trust, transparency, um, that allow our community then to come together and share the rest of the journey. But without that KPI, that tangible, that measurable, that that deliverable outcome, then it is just talking and and that's how to build faith and trust around. So yeah, let's, let's get something achieved is what I would say for DNA. Great. Well, thank you very much. It falls upon me now to thank all the guests today. It's been a real pleasure to be here with you today. So thank you to President Antonio Silva. Thank you, Andida, Pia, Graham. It's, it's been really interesting, especially to me. So I hope it's been interesting also for the people uh, watching on YouTube. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. In the end of this section, I would like to thank Nick for moderating and also to Pia, to Graham, and to Andida for the, not only the excellent contribution that they are doing in European aquatics related to the pillar one, good governance, integrity, and democracy, but also for the presentation that they made during this uh, Sports Integrity Unit. And of course, I will to address my compliments and wish the best to Siga for the rest of the week.